Well, I want to take a moment to describe to you what the VA Emerging Consciousness Program is. Um, I appreciate Dr. Beck's kind words this morning about the program's success here in the VA. But just a moment ago, I met someone who did not know what that program is. So I thought I'd stop first and tell you what it is. Um, for those of you who are familiar with brain injury, you know there are severities of brain injury. Imagine now a form of severe brain injury where someone is very slow to recover neurologically. In fact, they're so slow that we use diagnostic labels uh, within a category called disorders of consciousness to describe them. You're familiar with some of those labels. You've heard of people who are in a coma. You've heard of people who are in a vegetative state. And about a decade ago, a new term called minimally conscious state was coined to describe people who have a disorder of consciousness as well. Now, the unique thing about this program in the VA is that rehabilitation is not commonly available to people who have that diagnosis. Uh, how many non-veterans do we have in the room today? I'm one of them. If you had that form of severe brain injury, you might not have access to the program available to our veterans in the VA. So that, that access to rehabilitation that we have in the VA is to some extent controversial because it's not possible, right? But in, before I talk about the program, let me have you think about uh, another scenario. How many parents do we have in the room? Okay, when was the last time your child had a flu? If you took your, doc your child to the doctor and took the flu, your doctor gave you a diagnosis, said this is the flu. Here are the symptoms. You're going to probably have fever, body aches, chills, cough, um, and you're going to be uncomfortable, but you're going to have those symptoms probably for about two weeks, and then you'll be fine again. If you get to us early enough, we have a treatment. It's called Tamiflu, and we may be able to quicken your recovery. Okay. Now imagine in that same scenario, you're the parent of a child, but you're now in a hospital, and the diagnosis is not the flu, it's severe brain injury. And your doctor can't tell you what the long-term symptoms will be, how long it will take to recover, and says there is no treatment. However, there is rehabilitation, but your insurance won't pay for it. How would you feel? as a parent in that situation. For those angels in the room, and you know who you are, who do this work every day, that is the family that you deal with. They've been told those things. In fact, they may have been told worse things. They've been told their child may not survive. In fact, they did not. And then they got to the VA Emerging Consciousness Program where we have the chance to give them 90 days of rehabilitation. Sometimes they get more because they've made progress. In fact, coming to the VA and having those 90 days was like a gift to me as a clinician. Because when I worked in the private sector, we were lucky if we could get them in the door and if we had a week. And the only thing that we could do at that time was get insurance to approve family training so that the family could take them home. There's really no other alternative other than a nursing home for some. But the family could take them home I mean, very basic things, handle their meds, but we get to get them for 90 days. And we've learned a lot in the last decade of take, about taking care of people who come to us in that 90-day program. But it's controversial. But controversy is not new in rehabilitation. How many of you have heard of problems with rehabilitation? Okay. You think that's controversial? <laughs> Well, I have had the good fortune of spending time with a historian in rehabilitation, a gentleman named Dr. Preston Harley, who shared with me some interesting stories through our collaboration through the ACRM. And he told me about a time in the field of rehabilitation where professional journals would not publish articles about cognitive rehabilitation because it was considered fringe science. In fact, Preston, as one of the early authors of those studies, said that he personally received a letter from one of the editors saying that accused him of being unethical in delivering cognitive rehabilitation to brain injury survivors. 
Isn't that shocking? I was shocked and heard that information. Because where are we today? Today, people like Keith Cicero have published systematic studies to show not only is cognitive rehabilitation effective, it's effective for many types of cognitive disorders and for many types of brain injury conditions. We're in a very different place today. But it's because there were people who were persistent in promoting that treatment and evaluating and growing and understanding what it does. So controversy is not new in rehabilitation, but having a 90-day rehab program remains controversial. However, I think that's changing. So I, I promised Michaela I wouldn't do a scientific talk, but I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get away from some numbers. So I have a, a few things that are numbers for you, okay? If you go back to the 1990s, the state of the science of what we knew about people with this form of severe brain injury was summarized in the Multi-Society Task Forces Report in the New England Journal of Medicine. And at that time, the worldwide literature on disorders of consciousness, which back then just included coma and vegetative state, included 434 cases, the worldwide literature. Well, in that literature, only 26 of those cases were available for follow-up <coughs> after 12 months. And based on that sample size right there, the term permanent vegetative state was recommended. That might shock people, but that small number. But that is the state of the field because a lot of people die with early on after having a severe form of brain injury. Now, skip forward about another 10 years. How we care for people with brain injury has changed. Medical care has changed. We've learned a lot. And people are surviving these injuries in ways that we couldn't have imagined. And another innovative thing that the VA did about 2009 was start to commingle the polytrauma centers with the minor TBI model system centers. And from that synergy of people coming together, the very first and largest study in the literature about what happens to people with a disorder of consciousness has been published. And it was led by a VA author in the Journal of Trauma. And that sample size was 396. Now these are civilians. It took 25 years with more than 20 centers in the private world to get that sample size, all right? But what we know from those cases are some interesting numbers. Very different than the status of the literature 10 years earlier. One in five of those individuals regain the ability to live independently and work productively in society. That was unexpected. In addition, we learned that two thirds of them woke up and regain the ability to be oriented and meaningfully, get meaningfully engaged with their family members. Another phenomenal milestone in neurologic recovery. Well, as a result of that exciting collaboration between the VA and NIDR, new collaborations formed. People were getting excited in the field. And so the VA and, the, and NIDR and the American Congress of Rehabilitation formed, this is why I'm now sending a lot of titles across these different organizations, to put together a literature from around the world on the status of what's happening in disorders of consciousness rehabilitation. And in about a six year time frame, the VA treated 121 veterans and service members with that severe form of brain injury in six years. Now compare those numbers to the literature 10 years ago. That's a big number, okay? And we published our experience, as Dr. Hunt said, we published our experience with those patients, and we learned a lot. Again, two-thirds of these individuals also woke up. An additional 10% of them on the wake up based on our documentation. <coughs> so I, I just want to see the hand of people who worked on this, because this was an unfunded study that people did outside of their tour of duty in addition to their bug job to get this in the literature. And so that happened at all of the polytrauma centers. And so if you were one of the persons doing those medical records, reviewing charts, helping go through all the clinical notes so that we could document the medical complications, the specialists that were needed, and the outcomes deserved. Can you raise your hand? Thank you. patients, 
70 to 85 percent went on to regain the ability to be independent in ADL within five years of your injury. That's a pretty phenomenal recovery curve compared to what we knew about the science 10 years ago. So why do we do it? Why, why do we do these studies? Why do we expose ourselves to these tragic cases? Well, someone said to me recently that patients with disorders of consciousness are like extreme and I had to tell you, I had to go look the word up. I didn't know what it was. So I had to put a definition up here for you because I actually thought this was a brilliant analogy. Extreme files are living organisms that survive and thrive in the harshest physical and chemical environment. And why are there branches of science that study? Because if we can understand what it takes for an extreme file to survive and thrive, in that condition, it tells us a lot about what is critical to survival and thriving. So let me just quickly tell you about two of the extreme files that I treated in the VA. One of the very first patients that I saw when I became um, a member of, of the staff in Tampa, and he was a good old Texan, he was a Marine, and he was the kind of guy that when a neighbor had a, his mom told me that a neighbor had an alligator stuck in their backyard, which happens in Florida, uh, but apparently happens in Texas. And he was so worried about that alligator, he literally drove his pickup truck over there, wrestled the alligator to keep the alligator safe, put it in the back of his pickup truck and relocated it. That's just the kind of guy he was. He was in his early 20s, and he went off, was deployed, and had a severe brain injury. He came to our center and stayed with us many years, and I've never prayed so hard that somebody would wake up. To this day, he has not. It's been seven years later. But I've talked about his case in conferences because lots of things happened to him during that time that likely hindered his ability to recover. And those things are important to document. And I would encourage the clinicians in the room who treat those patients to think similarly about how you manage your cases and how you document because those observations are important. My second extreme file is someone who I didn't expect. Someone who got to us about a month out from his injury, from primarily an anoxic, he had uh, an overdose, and he also was assaulted. So he had just a, a mixture of things going on. He got to us, and for two months being with us, no progress. This is at a time when we normally see progress, when you're stable, when you're moving along, we see something. Nothing happens for 60 days. So we're having the conversations that you have with families about you know, we're three months in, and we've seen no improvements in injury. Well, in our observations over time, we've identified some comorbidities that we think are really common in this group. So we have a surveillance system in place on our unit, and it picked up something on, on this particular case, and he received a diagnosis for a very specific type of problem. That's a treatable condition. Um, and you'll actually see this case, uh, we were actually presenting this case at ACRM, and we have it slated for a special issue in JACR next year. But we treated that comorbid condition, and at 90 days out, he woke up. Not only did he wake up, he became oriented and started having conversations with his children. Wow, I learned something with that case. Those are why extreme files are important for us. These cases tell us about what is necessary to survive and thrive after brain injury. And this Dharma Scientific Program Manager who made this comment to me said, if you can understand what it takes for someone with severe brain injury to recover, you'll understand what it takes for a moderate or a mild to recover. And that analogy has not been lost on me today. So collectively, a lot of people around the world have come together to advance the science of what we know to do for people with severe brain injury. Uh, I have to tell you that I had someone ask me recently, why is it, why do you do this? Why, why do you do this work? What keeps you enthusiastic, excited, passionate? Why do you do all those extra things that you do? Um, why do you not burn out? Burnout is a very common complication among providers who work with this patient group and has been the focus of some of the scientific literature as well. Well, I think I have two secrets. One is I get to work collaboratively, collaboratively with others who share some passion. If you will, that's my support group. 
those people in that picture. And they can be your support group as well if you share that passion. Secondly, I have a lot of diversity in what I do. I think no matter what we do, having some diversity in what we do helps balance. Helping people with disorders of consciousness is not just providing clinical care, but it's when we publish a study, advance a case uh, study, we're doing something to help, not just that one patient, but the collective body of patients that we're trying to uh, serve better. So I want to bring you back to that case, that case situation I described for you just a moment ago. You're a parent of a child with severe brain injury, and you're standing over them, listening to your doctor. Today, because of what we know, seven years later, that conversation will be very different. We'll be able to talk about what some of the outcomes are, what your prognosis is. We'll be able to identify some of the things that we think might be going on to improve medical management. And that's exciting. It's exciting for our veterans, a lessons learned certainly for future wars. And I think it's something that will help you and help me and help our children so that rehabilitation is available for everyone who has severe pain.